You're watching the Anthony James YouTube channel, where I, Anthony James, as well as some of my friends, review TV and film. It would mean the world to me if you would subscribe. Hello, and welcome back to my channel. I'm here with Ema. Hello. And we are going to be reviewing His Dark Materials, Episode 1. Of Season 2. Of Season 2. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot about that. Right, uh, before we get into it, uh, I should say that um, Ema is a book reader. I am not. So therefore, she knows what's coming. Well, to a certain extent, she knows what's coming. Yeah. I'm sure that they will uh, change a few things. Yeah. Although, were they pretty uh, reliable in they're, the first? They're pretty on the nose with it. I mean... It's there are little bits and pieces of things that they're doing differently, but I can see why they have to for a TV adaptation. Yeah, you know, yeah. For time and things like that, so they're more or less true to the stories. I think so far, there's nothing that I feel like they've majorly changed. Okay, well, so, fair enough. So <laughs> we are going to be covering episode by episode every single week. It's going to be out on a Wednesday this week. So if you're watching this on Wednesday, hello. This is the day it's out. Every week we do plan on getting it out on a Monday evening at the latest. It's just that this week, we've got two young children. Uh, we've recorded this about three or four times now. Uh, one time, we actually thought we fully did it properly. Yeah. And then um, I actually did something wrong with their microphones, and I sounded like the devil. So Yeah. Uh, well, let's just say life. The universe had other plans, yeah. and our two children had other plans. Let's just say I, I, I sort of turned into Ema's demon. Is that a good one? No, it's a bad one. Oh, Okay, let me know when I have a good one. Right, okay, okay guys, so there'll be an interesting dynamic here. Ema's a book reader. I'm sure she'll get into all the things she loves about the show. I, I'll, I'll let you know what I thought of the first season. Now, I, as, a, as only a show watcher, not a book reader, I listened to the first chapter of the first book on audiobook. I didn't continue. I don't know why. No idea. But I really like the show, and I've, I love the idea of the demons uh, being the soul outside of the body. Absolutely love that. I love the idea uh, of the fact that it's a fantasy world, but it's actually quite modern in certain regards. It doesn't feel like uh, like a Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter, or well, I suppose Harry Potter's a little bit uh, in the modern day. It's it's a bit it's ambiguous though. I mean, it's still set in a castle. If people, they still wear robes, it still counts. Yeah, it still counts as normal. Like so, I was expecting like a proper medieval fantasy. Like I've heard of His Dark Materials, a fantasy series. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect it to be sort of. Victorian? Yeah, I I mean, I guess it's still ambiguous. Victorian-y, you know? And it's also like the idea of the parallel world as well. No idea. Like, you hear about this, the series, His Dark Materials, for so many years, Amber Spire, Glass, everything like that. No way in the world would I have ever guessed it was about the, it was about the portals to other dimensions and things. Yeah, because I think it's fair to say that this story is, obviously it's a fantasy, but there's definitely an argument to be made for it's also sci-fi. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, it's, fantasy and sci-fi. Yeah, I know, but I mean, there it's a fine line. It's a fine line, and this is definitely whereas, as you say, the likes of Harry Potter or Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings, it's firmly within fantasy. This is treading the line. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of dipping in and out of either side of it. Uh, so it is quite different from you know the the sort of tropes that we expect from fantasy. Yeah. Exactly. So. Every single uh, week, we're going to be covering this. I love the show. What email? Like, so uh, you don't want to get. I don't want to get you into a full on thing about the books here. Mm -hmm. But what do you think about this first series of the TV show in relation to the books? We, you said it was pretty reliable. Do, do you like the adaptation? Yeah, I will say. Um, I I absolutely love the books, and uh, whenever I found out that they were making this show, the bar was very high in my mind. But mm -hmm. I had good faith that it would be really good. The main thing for me is casting, because you know, Mrs. Coulter is one of my favourite literary characters. And I think actually she is my favourite literary character mm. completely because she's so, like, there's so much depth to her and she's such a fascinating, intricately sort of designed person. Mm -hmm. um, so for that reason, I thought, uh, will they ever cast someone good enough? Does a good enough person exist to play this role? <laughs> and I have to say... So far, uh, I think Ruth Wilson is doing a fantastic job. Okay, awesome. That was my main concern was, will they get the right people? Yeah, well, I think Ruth Wilson's doing a fantastic job too, but obviously I don't know what the book character is. Yeah. Um, and especially in this episode, let's transition. So we're transitioning into the episode now. Um, this episode had a fantastic, near the beginning of, this, of the episode, there was a fantastic scene, very dramatic scene, of Mrs. Coulter basically trying to sort of stage a coup on the magisterium, yeah. I suppose. Well, like, it's... 
it's basically saying, oh, no, I'm the captain now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she was never not the captain, really. It's just them finding out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so she's, uh, she, there was a huge, like, the, the actual, the acting and the performance in the scene itself, she sort of, Mrs. Coulter has an air of, you know, she just assumes, and most of the time correctly, she assumes that she is the leader in a room. She's the most yeah. important person in a room. She's the only, only one that's actually correct in the room. I think it's fair to say she's nine times out of ten, if not more, the most intelligent person in the room. Like, this is the thing about Mrs. Coulter, is that she is like a master chess player. Yeah. And she is also, uh, really, she's a master manipulator. She can kind of predict in her head, like, two or three steps ahead. Well, if I do this, that person's going to do that, so I'm going to do it this way. You know, mm-hmm. I think she's always playing a game. She's she's really manipulative and, you know, um, a complete sort of Yeah, manipul- manipulative. That's something I wanted to pick up on because... Yeah. She's she's going fully against Azriel now. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that she's loyal to the Magisterium. No, I think she only ever cared about herself. Yeah. As a character, she is a, a climber. She, you know, it's all about... I think for her, she doesn't care about the Magisterium. She's working for them as one of their top scientists or explorers or whatever it is mm-hmm. that she is... Her job title is. Um, But she's doing it because they give her power. I don't think she has any emotional or connection or any integrity yeah. pushing her towards that direction i think it's literally just here's where i can get to that i'll be comfortable and i'll be ha- you know I'll, I'll be in control so i'm gonna pursue that okay okay so that's yeah so i sort of did get that from there she sort of wants to assume the control or the lead of the magisterium yeah but not necessarily because she's loyal to it on yeah that's what i think yeah, sort of thing. yeah I, th- I think mrs coulter only cares about mrs coulter yeah yeah that makes sense yeah um so one thing that I, as as a non book reader, again picked up on in this first episode, mm-hmm. which maybe you know you give a little bit more information on, is that I assumed whenever Roger was killed at the end of season one, that the portal that was created to a different dimension was mm-hmm. going to be only temporary. But actually, it turns out that it's permanent. I mean, I assume it's permanent. Is that what you? Yeah. I assume so. I mean, I think it's just like a, a it's a terror in existence now. Yeah. You know, it's it's just they've they've broken the seal. Mm-hmm. between the worlds i think that's that's how i always so that's yeah it. and and actually that reminds me actually i was going to ask you mm-hmm. does that mean that the uh the portal between lyra's world and our world was created by some something similar like did someone get killed to create that portal you'll have to watch on <laughs> i'm gonna try and avoid spoilers for you uh um, now i'm really interested so i'm um, re- hang on oh it's so Roger did get killed, but it was because of the amount of power from him being separated from his uh, his th- demon? Well, Azrael noted that there was a huge amount of uh, excess energy expelled whenever they were doing the experiment by yeah. separating demons. And he basically realized there's a whole lot of untapped potential here. Mm. So I'm going to use it, use that... Uh, release of energy for my own ends basically he realized he had access to enough power to actually physically tear the world open okay and he decided to use it that's not a spoiler like that happened last yeah no of course it and and the thing is like actually i'm coming onto a theory now in my mind as we as we speak that's exciting so asriel yeah didn't he in some way know about will parry's father yeah didn't he uh did he i'm very I'm not sure if he did or not, but I think I thought that he did. I thought that he did. I, I maybe maybe he didn't, but for some reason in my head, because I know that Will Parry it showed a picture of his dad and he was like in the snowy time, snowy yeah. place. So that's maybe why my head thought that Azriel was sort of following in his footsteps because he was also in the snow, even though the picture would have been taken in our world. It does. It's so. It's my connection there is really weird, but I've just thought. I think the portal between our world and and Lyra's world mm-hmm. was created in some way by Will Parry's father. Possibly. Uh, I'm Or by his actions in some way. That's 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 what I believe. So I do think that Will Parry's father is gonna be come into it in a huge way. Um I think that's a fair assumption. Yeah. I mean Will Parry is like I mean, he obviously wants to know about his own father. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's not it's not going to be a huge shock to to sort of think that Will Parry himself is going to pursue answers regarding what happened to his father. So that's all I'll say because I, I don't 
I'm kind of afraid of giving anything Okay, away. okay. Yeah. I'm not going to force you to say no, anything. No. Something I noticed about Will, well, <laughs> it's weird to say noticed, because I had never really given much thought to the idea that he doesn't have a demon before. Mm-hmm. Because you know how he's a human? Uh, well, I mean, they're all human. No, I know that, but because yeah. he was in his in our world in the yeah, first season, yeah. it wasn't jarring or it wasn't that's... strange that he yeah. didn't have a demon. So I never even really put the idea that whenever he came and met Lyra, that it would be so obvious that he doesn't have one. You know? Yeah, but it makes sense though because you know, there's Lord Boreal goes to mm-hmm. Oxford yeah. frequently, and he does have a demon. Yes, and it always has to be hidden. And whenever it gets spotted, everyone's like, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So it's just like the inverse of that. Yeah, no, no. Of course, yeah, of course. Yeah. It's just in my head. I never. Yeah, makes, you never thought about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it makes me think of if if Will did did have a demon, what would it be? You mm-hmm. know, um, it's interesting. It's interesting. I I I I've, I have a few thoughts about that. Um, in terms of the idea of the demon, though. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about it in this episode. Um, and I'm I'm giving a lot of my thoughts here, Emma. So no, cut go, me off if you, if you want to. Um, I, you know, because you're afraid to say anything just in case. But uh, I'll, I mean, I'll critique the episode, like you know. But when you're talking about theories and stuff, I'm kind of going. Right. Okay. Well, we'll come back to my 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 thing there. Let's yeah. talk about the actual episode for a while then. Um, what about uh? So in this episode, we had a lot of character development in terms of Ly- well, sort of relationship development, I suppose, between yeah. Lyra and Will. They first they just met each other. And already it seems like they're going to be a great pairing. Oh, hang on, but maybe not at the end. What did you think of, you know, because uh, Lyra on the old alethiometer saw that he's he's a murderer? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so what did you think about the the sort of the beginning of this relationship, friendship, slash whatever it is? Uh, I really enjoyed seeing it unfold because we know it's very, it's very cool that we got to know each of them as individuals uh, from season one and they never crossed paths in season one. Yeah. And this is the first time that we... We as an audience, we know them as individuals. We know what Lyra is like. We know she's a bit, uh, well, she was essentially kind of raised half wild running around Mm -hmm. Oxford having fun and kind of is not a person who could be tamed, which is very endearing, you know, like, you know, that's, that's why we're endeared to her as a character and she's got no inhibitions. And she's kind of like Bran at the start of Game of Thrones. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's a free person. Mm -hmm. You know, she's no inhibitions. She, she does her own thing. She, you know, she is just sort of can't be tamed. Yeah. And, uh, whereas the contrast to that is Will, who is not that he's, uh, not, uh, not that we're not endeared to him. We very much are, but for a very different reason in that he is, He's had to be responsible. He's had to grow up uh, very sort of quickly because he is caring for his mentally ill mother. Mm-hmm. And that's a vast contrast to Lyra. So from that perspective, you know, she ha- she is this sort of wild, organic uh, person just sort of doing her own thing and, and you know, going whatever way the wind takes her. Yep. Whereas Will, by contrast, has had to remain in one place, has had to be there at certain times, has had to look after his mother, has had to be that rock for her and and hasn't been Had able not had to... a minute to himself. No, he basically hasn't. He's a child carer. And uh, I think that uh, we know that about both of them. So we, I think it's, it's going to be nice to see them balance each other out. Yeah. You can already see that in that, you know, he, the quite funny scene where he... Uh, he like made the omelette and she didn't know what it was and she was like, Are you a kitchen boy, what's this about? Yeah. And uh later <laughs> later she kind of Lyra being the ambitious sort of a person she is, not one to be one up, she's like, Well, I'm gonna make my own omelette and it's just full of shells. <laughs> I mean I think that's yeah, really that's, nice. That's, she did a terrible job with that omelet, like <laughs> it was really funny though. I thought, you know, it's it's kind of that's a really nice example of their dynamic Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know going forward i can see this being their dynamic it's gonna be so it's like the odd couple (laughs) yeah exactly he's he's gonna have to kick be a carer he's he's gonna try he's gonna actually act as her carer and then maybe i think she's like a mental patient or something (laughs) no i mean the thing is it's i know what you mean i think he's going to be a caring person to her but she also doesn't she's also super independent but he'll get frustrated he'll get frustrated by that i mean the other side of that coin is that maybe she'll bring out a looseness from him that he needs you know he he like they'll rub off on each other i think and that you know he needs help probably letting his hair down yeah and he has not had to he has not had to go with the flow before yeah um he has had to be in control and he's had to be sort of rigid in his lifestyle so far and Lyra is the total opposite so I think they're going to be good for each other and I'm enjoying seeing that dynamic unfold because they're both good people you know yeah they're nice we like them both as an audience okay awesome so uh yeah in terms of um 
In terms of that, what do you think about the uh, the fact that Lyra now thinks he's a murderer because of what the alethiometer told her? In my mind, that's going to be a plot point that's going to be very quickly got over. I, I think that she's going to, in the next episode or very soon, she's just going to come out and say it to him. And then there'll be yeah. an explanation and they'll realize he'll re- they'll realize that actually both both of them are running from the same people. Yeah, possibly. I think I think well, it's notable that the alethiometer has not explained the full context. You know, it's it, it's not. I don't it's, know how it would. Well, I know, but it could have said he killed a person. Yeah, that's yeah. different than he's a murderer. Yeah, you know, it was a loaded statement from the alethiometer. Um, but no. So who's controlling the alethiometer? Well. <laughs> uh, well, uh, knowing <laughs> knowing knowing Lyra, uh, I think the information that she has that according to the alethiometer that he is a murderer, mm-hmm. I think she's probably just glad to know that and know that he doesn't know that she knows. Yeah, if that makes sense. Because like at the end of the day, we know Lyra; she's an intelligent girl. Uh, we know who her mother is, mm-hmm. um, and you know I think her mother's obviously super intelligent as well. I can see. Lyra using this information sort of in a way to to her benefit that she could she she'll know she'll be able to make a better judgment on him. Yeah. You know, knowing this context, okay, he's a mur- he's killed someone. You know, I, I don't know. I th- I think she I think she is less annoyed by the fact that he's a murderer because She's glad to have that on him, if that makes sense. Yeah, she's always got something in the back of her pocket. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's that's one for her, that's one for her arsenal for later. And okay. She's still she's still I think undecided whether whether or not she's going to keep him. <laughs> yeah, well, there's one thing I wanted to talk about was the um the fact that the the demons are called demons mm-hmm. and they're the soul of people. Yes. And that made me start going down a rabbit hole of thought and analysis on the show. That I just want you to let me know if I'm in the right direction or the wrong direction or whatever, but. Uh, I was thinking, like, it's interesting that the the religious type, uh, you know, magisterium, yeah. are being portrayed as the bad guys, and they're the can they control you, um, and the uh, and the demon that you usually portrayed as evil yeah. is actually the soul of the characters. Yeah, and it's interesting to me that this is all flipped. Um, so that they they flipped the meaning, or like the what's usually portrayed as good and evil, um. They flipped the meanings complete to the complete opposite now. Yeah. So in in my mind, and it's it's interesting as well because um, Lyra actually said about dust. She said, um, "Bad people think it's bad, so maybe it's good." Yeah. And that made me think that this is perhaps Philip Pullman trying to get across the idea that um, if the controlling religion thinks something's bad, then actually they're completely wrong and it's good is this the theme of the show that i'm sort of working through at the minute well it's very very much the theme of the show is Mm -hmm. uh from the offset it's very obvious that philip pullman is making a commentary on organized religion we don't get a sense that the magisterium or the church as we would call it is any good we've seen we've seen no evidence that is anything other than an organization uh sort of working its way into power yeah we've we've seen nothing that would indicate that especially as well kind of if you didn't already get that vibe it's cemented by um the scene in this episode where they want to get the cardinal to come up and look at the rip in the sky yeah. and he says it's heresy because he you know he doesn't like change he's used to the status quo and he likes it that way and you know you know i, I think you're right what i'm saying is you're right <laughs> yeah yeah but the fact is the cardinal as well doing that not wanting to see the, the sort of underneath people in the magisterium who yeah. have seen it mm-hmm. and are starting to maybe waver in their faith of the magisterium, mm-hmm. they're going to follow Mrs. Coulter, mm-hmm. I think, because because they can clearly see that their leader is just blind, is choosing to be blind. Yeah, that's what I think. Anyway, um, okay, so there was a few, there's a couple actually other things you know uh, we'll touch on quickly. First of all, the spectres. What did you think about that? I have to say, uh. I was surprised that we saw them hmm. in episode one, uh, but I'm really glad we did because I think that was spectacular. We mentioned before off camera we were chatting about how it looks like the smoke monster from Dark from Lost. Uh, yeah, Lost. <laughs> yes, from Lost. <laughs> it's all merging now. <laughs> it looks like the God particle from Dark. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> kind of. You know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So it looks, it, it's very reminiscent of the smoke monster from Lost. Yeah. And uh, I really like that about it because it's not, it's also not exactly the same. Um, I have to say, uh, whenever I was picturing it in my head, whenever I was reading the books, I was imagining something a bit more like the Dementors in Harry Potter. Mm. Um, you know, the, uh, and I mean the film. Humanoid, de- yeah. Yeah, I, I'm talking about the film depiction yeah, of yeah, the Dementors. Yeah. Um, because they're humanoid, but they're also kind of all floaty. Mm. And I kind of half expected us to obviously see some sort of being within that that wasn't just sort of purposefully moving smoke yeah sort of lines it always did look like smoke though it, yeah, yeah it, it looked like, like liquid that was in the air but it, but it also was kind of stringy in a way like yeah it was, like it was almost like the tentacles of a of a jellyfish in a way yeah um it was really cool it was really cool i liked it a lot and i have to say that end shot of uh, it rising up behind Will and then it just cuts. Yeah. It was so exciting because I think it w- it looked like it was almost going to rise up and like become a figure. Like mm. it looks like it was about to take its form and we didn't get to see it. Yeah, and it's, will, so, yeah. it's so tantalizing. It's like, oh, you can't just end it there. It's, what? Like, it's like a boggart. You can't, you know, yeah, you're not allowed it, to see what it looks like. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's continually changing in yeah. your peripheral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, So the last thing we sort of should, well, there's a couple of other things we should touch on. While we're still in the specter zone. Yeah. What do you, uh, we, we had a sort of a guest appearance here uh, by Liana Mormont from... Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> what's her name from, from Game of oh, Thrones? Oh, Bella Ramsey. Bella Ramsey, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, she was spectacular in it. She did I a great job, yeah. She, she won the nation's hearts as uh, Lady Mormont. Yeah. And, uh, the, the, the world's heart, I think. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And uh, but she, So everybody loved her in Game of Thrones. She was uh, stern and no-nonsense and, you know, just was fantastic from you know in that regard and here we see her as a completely different person equally as stern and no nonsense but a complete evil little shit (laughs) (laughs) like i thought she did such a good job of uh being such a different person than we've seen her be before tell you what she's got some strong teeth on her (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) opening the bottles with her teeth that was that was great though that was so cool it was like was that in the book (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say I don't remember but I really liked it uh, as you know it was a real like nod to how feral they were yeah, these yeah. kids running around a city with no grown ups it was just like yeah, they're all pirates now <laughs> yeah exactly this is, this is just like what happens when, when you just throw a load of children together and let them become wild yeah it's, I, I really like that as well I, yeah. I don't know if the like in my mind uh, Will and Lyra aren't staying in this one world for very long. In my mind they're going to start jumping through different worlds. Um but I don't know that's going to happen but I assume it's going to happen. Uh just I don't know why. I just think it's going to happen. Well, you know that there's multiple worlds according to their scientific theories. Mm-hmm. So Exactly. So yeah. that's why I think it's going to happen. I think yeah. they're going to jump start yeah. jumping between worlds. So no, no, I don't really necessarily think if Bella Ramsey is going to stay around uh, Angelica the character name. I don't think she's going to stay around forever. Uh Maybe she will, but in my mind, that's it's going to be a sort of a very short, great character. Yeah. Then off they go. Um, uh, the last thing that we should probably should touch on, because otherwise it'd be weird if we didn't mention it, is the whole sort of subplot of the witches in this episode. Yeah. So there was a witch called Ruta Skadi, mm-hmm. and she is a queen of a tribe. And then obviously, uh, Seth, uh, Serafina, Serafina, Safarina. I was going to say, <laughs> Serafina Pekala is the uh, queen of a different tribe. Well, we say tribe. Maybe that's not the right word for it. But... Oh, yeah, I think it's the right word. Okay. I so... mean, you could say coven, but I think they refer to them in, in the stories as tribes. Okay, so yeah. the different queens. And uh, Serafina Pekala sort of says no to going and saving Katya, who's being tortured by Mrs. Coulter. And she's ripping out the uh, little... Oh, the cloud pine. Yeah, the this cloud way. pine. When she first ripped out the first one, yeah. she said, this is where all your magic comes from. She rips the first one out. In my head, I was thinking, is that... What... Is that her no magic now? I didn't realize there was a load of them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, it's it's kind of like you can see it in, in the sort of makeup yeah. on her back. It's like, it almost looks like scarification. Yeah, all over it's her all back, raised, yeah. raised bumps of like leaves. and. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But the way they built up to it and they, she pulled out the one, I thought yeah. that was just one of them, you know? Yeah, I mean? yeah. But then, and then later on when uh, Serafina Pekala, was it Serafina Pekala gave the one to um, Lin-Manuel Miranda. Yeah, I think it was her. Yeah, Lee Scoresby. Yeah. Um, she gave, yeah, so, because when she gave that to him, I was like, hang on, how does she have magic now? And then they went back to torturing Katya and took another one out. I was yeah. like, oh, they've got I, multiple. I, I think it's kind of more symbolic as well. I, and that I always understood it like, for example, if your um, plant in you was, say, a fir tree, mm-hmm. I imagine that you could grab a bit of any fir tree because that's that person's calling card. Okay. That's how I imagined it. Okay. 
I could be wrong. You could be wrong. Okay. It could, you know what? Uh, well, that's the, let us know actually in the comments if you yeah. read about that. Yeah, actually, because I might have just misinterpreted this, or or maybe I'm remembering it wrongly. Because I it, I will admit it has been a couple of years since I last read the book, so I, it could just have got all mashed in my head. Right. So I thought this is the thing. I thought that it was very like um, you know, like uh, how Eowyn in uh, Lord of the Rings gives Aragorn her necklace. Yeah. And it was like a really special thing. Yeah. That's what I assumed from just watching that episode, but. As you say, it might not be that. It might just be, like, the, the diamond doesn't here. Take one of those. Yeah, that's the impression I got. But I guess maybe it, maybe it has to be given to you by the witch. Yeah, maybe. maybe she can pick any bit, random bit of her yeah. ma- her sort of assigned it's like, tree. It's, it's, so it's like, it's like the uh, what your core of your wand is in Harry Potter? Yeah, that's mm. what I imagine. Okay. Again, weigh in on the comments. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Yeah, guys, but if you want to ask us questions about the show, you want to make a comment that we can sort of touch on next week, mm-hmm. uh, be our guest, that's our that's our general thoughts of the first episode. Emma, what did you think? Uh, sort of, we don't really do out of 10, especially for for an episode by episode, uh, episode show, but I thought this was a really good episode, really good start. Um, it was action-packed in a way, yeah. but it also spent a lot of time sort of character development as well. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Uh, I think it it was a really good first episode in it that it managed to be in equal parts sort of exciting and fast paced in parts and mm-hmm. dynamic, but we still had time to enjoy character development, enjoy a budding relationship between our two main characters. That it, yeah, it felt know, like we had seen them on screen before. Yeah, and in fact, when the show ended, I went, "Is that it? Yeah, that didn't feel like a, an hour long or whatever it was. Fifty minutes. 50, of, yeah, yeah it, forty-eight it didn't, minutes. It didn't feel like you know fifty minute long show. I I kind of felt robbed. I was like." What's the rest of it? <laughs> yeah, and like, I feel like that's a sign of a good show. That like there there wasn't a bit of like there wasn't a minute of TV that they they wasted. Yeah, exactly. You know? So and you know we do love this show and like to be to be honest with you, I only cover shows on my channel that I like. So I'm, I probably come across as I love everything. But the thing is, if I don't like a show, that's I'd, all good. If I don't like a show, I'm not really caring about talking about it episode by episode. No, you, well you wouldn't put yourself through an entire yeah, series I, I, of something I, you hit. For so. example, Cursed. I put one review up of that, didn't yeah. like it. But if I'm covering a show week to week, I'm going to like it. So we'll yeah. try and pick out things we don't like as we go. But this first episode for me was really good uh, and there wasn't much I didn't like in it. So I think that's us for this week, Emma. We'll so. catch you hopefully next Monday. Um, but as, as I say, there's nothing guaranteed in this life yeah. when you have two, ch- two children under three. So. Yeah, exactly. I mean... We, I mean, we've got one. One of them is uh, sleeping on Ema's lap right now, and yeah. has been there the whole whole video. So, if you want to go back and watch the video again, you'll see Ema looking down at him the whole time. Yeah, every so often, it's like oh, this is how we keep him quiet long enough to actually get this video made. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're welcome, guys. You're, you're welcome. So, thanks very much for watching, everyone. Um, catch us next week, and I'm looking forward to the next episode. Leave a comment, subscribe. See you later. See you later.